Richard Rorty meets Donald Davidson for a discussion that falls broadly into three sections. First, Rorty questions Davidson on his views about truth. Second, he solicits Davidson's opinions about the history of analytic philosophy. And finally, the views of the two on the concept of metaphor are compared. At the outset, Davidson is asked to explain why he sees truth to be such a fundamental notion in philosophy. Rorty questions the importance of the notion of truth in theories of meaning and language learning, and he criticizes Davidson's arguments for why he is not a disquotationalist about truth. Then he discusses with Davidson the position of relativism about truth. The second part of this discussion is a critical examination of the history and status of analytic philosophy. Rorty offers his own views about analytic philosophy, and he invites Davidson to respond to them. In the course of this response, Davidson locates his own work, particularly the project of Davidsonian semantics, in the context of the history of analytic philosophy. Finally, both philosophers are asked about their respective ideas and metaphor. Rorty admits that almost all his notions about metaphor are based on Davidson's, and any apparent differences between them in this matter are reconciled. We join the discussion at Donald Davidson's home in Berkeley, California. I'm delighted to introduce uh, the next discussant in uh, the Davidson series, uh, Richard Rorty, longtime colleague and friend of Professor Davidson. He's University of Professor of Humanities at the University of Virginia, and he'll discuss topics of truth, meaning, and reference. Professor Rorty. I thought it might be useful to begin by some reflections on what I think divides our motives in being in philosophy. I, mean, I was trying to write something about you and Tarski, and I found myself saying, uh, you know, you go for formal systems, I don't. But that's, that's not really, I think, the important difference. I think that you, you know, you think, you have constructive projects in philosophy, <laughs> and I don't. I mean, you know, it's, I, I suppose the difference is I never really wanted a theory of meaning or, you know, much less the definition of a truth predicate for a language. I just wanted sort of ammunition to use against the philosophical tradition. And so, you know, I, I glommed on to your remarks about correspondence, about representation, and so on, but um, it's in, in a way, it's you know my role with your work has been you know snapper up of unconsidered trifles or something like that, or not exactly unconsidered trifles, no, but you know exactly. it's it's uh, you know um, snap snap you know taking taking things that you say out of context and weaving them together with stuff other people say, but in in a sense passing your project by. <laughs> It's, I, I, perhaps more, more particularly, I mean, when you said in a recent paper that we were never going to have a use theory of meaning in the sense that if you didn't go by way of truth, you could nonetheless just you know, have a theory of meaning based around use. I followed the argument and I agreed, and my reaction was, yeah, and who wanted a theory of meaning? <laughs> uh, that is. I guess I, you know, when I read Wittgenstein, when I read the investigations, it made me think, you know, a lot of this stuff I was brought up to think we needed, maybe we don't need. And last year when I was teaching the investigations, I suddenly found myself saying in the last session, look, if you want to know the moral of this book, let me read it to you. And then I quoted the last paragraph of A Nice Arrangement of Epitaphs. And this stuff about no such thing as a language in the sense in which philosophers have usually understood it, no portable interpreting machine, and so on. And I suppose, you know, thinking that that essay, in particular its final paragraph, incarnated pretty much the moral of <laughs> the investigations, I then, looking back over the whole sweep of your work, ask myself, uh, does he still think that a language must have a recursive structure in order to be learnable? Uh, 
truth and meaning and the paper on learnable languages were fairly tightly related. Uh, and you've spoken less about learnable languages in recent years. And so I began to think, well, maybe at this point, after a nice arrangement, uh, somebody could say, nobody, recurs nobody internalized a recursive procedure, they just learned how to talk the way they learned how to ride a bicycle. And maybe, maybe this whole idea of language as having a structure which a theory of meaning will tell us about can go by the boards. Anyway, I'd be interested in what you think of this you know, line of thought. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, taken with formal structures for their own sake at all. Uh, uh, they're just certain areas where it seemed to me that they brought light where there had been darkness before. Uh, and those are very special cases. Uh, I mean, the only two formal structures I've really had much to do with are, are uh, uh, formal semantics uh, on, on the one hand and decision theory on the other. Uh, and that's because it, it has seemed to me that they really did throw several different kinds of light uh, on the nature of rationality. Uh, uh, I, I don't see the contrast that you do mm -hmm. uh, between early work and late. Uh, uh, well, I mean, it's not that I haven't changed my mind about things. Cer certainly a nice derangement uh, was, was a matter of a change of emphasis, at least. Uh, part of the change there was, only part of it, but part of it was, uh, I'd been, become increasingly struck with the importance of emphasizing uh, th that it's not necessary to share a language with somebody else in order to understand what they say, at least certainly not if languages are the kind of things that philosophers have talked about, something that people have to share almost to the last detail mm -hmm. and, in order to, and, and know in advance what yeah. people are going to mean by what they say. Uh, uh, so interpretation has come for me to mean entirely one person understanding another. Uh, uh, and that, that, that uh, doesn't depend uh, upon assuming that they mean the same thing by their words as you mean or even that they mean the same thing as anybody else at all. I mean, they, they can make it up on the spur of the moment, and very often we follow uh, what's going on. Now, that was the thing I was emphasizing, uh, though, uh, in, in a nice derangement, though I also was emphasizing the fact that, that in understanding somebody, we bring every bit of knowledge that we have about the world, about people, uh, uh, about this particular person, and so forth, into play. Uh, so whatever it is that formal semantics can do, it's only a small part of, of what there is to do. Uh, on the other hand, I do think that formal semantics uh, it, it gives us a pattern uh, which we have to which has to be there. I won't say that we have to recognize it because of course most of us don't mm. ha have any idea what it is. We couldn't say. Uh, and, and so I don't think we internalize a theory. Uh, if I ever said that, I take it back. Uh, what I've been saying for a good while now is rather, the only person who needs this theory is me. Uh, I want the theory because I would like to say what kind of a thing it is that somebody, what kind of a pattern, so to speak, their actual speech behavior shows. Because without that, I don't think I could make any sense out of what they say. So I, I am saying 
there's something about them that this pattern reveals, but it's not something they can state. Uh, and it's not as though I even think they've internalized some rules or something of that sort, because I, I, I'm not yeah. even inclined to put it that way. I agree with you about the bicycle riding. Learning to speak is like learning to ride a bicycle, if for no other reason, because we have, when we're learning a first language, we haven't got what it takes to build a theory. Uh, that, that only comes once mm -hmm. we've got a language. So we, it has to be like picking up a skill. Uh, but I would like to say, nevertheless, how is it that we can understand uh, things that people say which we've never heard before or produce sentences which we, we haven't understood before? Something like a recursive apparatus explains that. Uh, it, it, it's not conscious. A little bit of it's conscious. Mm -hmm. A little bit. Just yeah. wee bits. Yeah. I mean, I would say somebody doesn't understand my word and if they don't know, if asked, <laughs> whether a conjunction is true, if and only if each of the conjuncts is true, mm -hmm. however you put it to them. So little bits of what goes into a Tarski theory, people actually know explicitly. Uh, and they, I think a little Socratic questioning, a very little, would bring out the fact that they understand that you can put different predicates into the same sentence format, so to speak, uh, and that will alter the meaning of what's said in a rather systematic way. But that's all that, that the, recur the recursive theory tells you. I mean, mm -hmm. it just makes explicit that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I sometimes am inclined to quibble, as you know, with the phrase you used in the structure and con in the structure yeah. and content of truth about the pattern truth makes. I mean, it seems to me that you know when you say no, I'm not going to be a discotationalist. People like me and you know people who have doubts about Tarski's utility, Etchemendy, Putnam, whatnot. Uh, their reaction is something like this. Look, we recognize Donald's point that truth is different from justification, that you shouldn't have an epistemic theory of truth, or some of us do anyway. Uh, we recognize that truth is objective, not in the sense that it corresponds to the way the world is, but in the sense that uh, you can have all the justification in the world and still not have truth. Uh, okay, so much for objective truth. Then there's this other thing, the recursive character of language, such that the uh, truth of the sentences is affected by what components you stick in and can be changed in systematic ways by what you do and don't stick in. Um, there's this thing called a Tarski's type theory of truth, which takes care, you know, nicely exhibits the pattern of the latter. Um, okay, what does that have to do with, you know, the difference between truth and justification? <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, when you say, you know, truth is a central concept, my reaction is always, well, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's central for this purpose over here, and there's another sense of it maybe, or, okay, forget it. Maybe it's the same sense that central over here. You know, there are a lot of useful things you can do with it. You can't get along without it. But somehow the issue between you and the disquotationalists never, you know, I've never gotten that sharp. And I think a lot of other people haven't. I mean, you know, people keep saying, you know, oh, come on, you know, is there really a big difference here? <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And I, I find myself perplexed. I mean, you know, when you go through the details, why I am not a disquotationalist, you know, I think I get it. And then I think at the end, yeah, but, you know, so no, uh, you know, it's, I mean, it, it's almost as if, you know, you were, a, you were, you wanted to do honor to this thing called truth that I can't see, you know, I can't see there's a thing to do honor to. Uh, I, don't and, want, oh, I don't want to do honor to it. Uh, uh, it seems to me uh, a concept we all have, and 
it's important philosophically because you don't even know what a belief is if you don't have the concept of truth because a belief is something that can be true or false. Uh, and if you don't know that, you don't know what a belief is. In fact, I'm not sure you can even have a belief if you don't understand that maybe you don't think some particular belief of yours could possibly be false, but you certainly know about a lot of them right. that they could be. Uh, and if you don't know that, it's not a belief. Right. Well, that makes it absolutely central. It doesn't make it good. It, and uh, I think we're in agreement that, that it doesn't make sense to say we should strive for truth or that it's a goal or a value even. I, I don't. I don't think it is. Uh, uh, because we can't tell the difference between a, a true belief and, and one that fits all of our evidence and that other people agree with, mm -hmm. <laughs> that we respect, and so forth. Uh, we can't tell the difference between that and being right. So there's no point in. I mean, you might as well say we we want other people to agree with us. That's what we aim for, and we aim for something that we're happy with because it fits with all the other things that we think we know, uh, which means believe. Uh, so I agree with you about that. I, I'm, I'm not promoting truth in the way in which, let's say, Plato thought mm, it was. Yeah. You know, it was a very good thing. I, I don't think it's a very good thing, I, I, but I, it's not because I think it's a bad thing. It, it's just. It's a concept we can't, that's very, very central because it's central to having propositional attitudes. See, I'm very struck with the difference between reacting to the world in no matter how complex ways. Uh, some of them learned, some of them instinctive, very sensitive to changes in the environment and so forth, but without thought. And it seems to me that the concept of truth is the thing we have to have to make this difference. I, you know, I, I guess I think that there's a whole slew of concepts we got to have, the logical connectives, the notion of social approbation, uh, the notion, uh, you know, lots of notions. Truth is one of them. Um, but, yeah, I mean, to put, to put it another way, you, you got to have a logical and semantical meta-language if you're going to think at all, or parts of such a language. Uh, you got to have this language as a way of autocriticism or, you know, cooperation in societal criticism. Um, and maybe I'm just fussing about, you know, the platonic overtones of the word true, and I shouldn't be. I just can't, you know, when I'm told it's central, or that you know, there's a pattern it makes, or the pattern pattern rationality makes. I'm inclined to say, well, you know, they're human beings who get together and do things, and of course they make 16 different patterns. <laughs> and you can call it rationality, you can call it truth, you can call it, you know, complex social practice, you know, type 13, uh, you know, but it's somehow disconnected with most of the things that. It's disconnected with enough of the things that people have talked about when they talked about truth that I keep thinking you share a motive with the disquotationalists and that the difference between you is, I don't know. Uh, no, no. Uh, uh, I, I agree with, with much of, of that. I mean, certainly truth is not, I mean, maybe to call it central is, is uh, just a reaction against the disquotationalists and other people who want to play down. Uh, I mean, to actually to claim it's something basically trivial. Uh, I agree. It's no more important than a dozen or more 
concepts without, we have to have all of them if we've got any. Right. Yeah. Causality, time, space, belief, intention, uh, there, there are a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we, we couldn't understand somebody who didn't have all of them. Uh, the, uh, one of the few that worries me, I mean, you have to get really out on the edge before the ones I'm sure you don't have to have, but they uh, close to the edge of the notion of sincerity. I say, I'm not sure whether you can even, although assertions don't have to be sincere, I'm not sure you can grasp the concept of assertion without having the concept mm. of sincerity. Yeah. It's a pretty basic, yeah, right. pretty basic notion. Yeah. Uh, uh, but so I'm, I'm with you there. I mean, I, I, think, I think what you say about that is right. Uh, and I agree with you that my, what I say about it, what I think about the notion of truth is very different from what people were after, not just what they said, but what they were after mm -hmm. uh, when they put forward correspondence theories, coherence theories, and pragmatic theories. I mean, all of them wanted to tag this notion in some short way really reduce it to some other things. Um, and, uh, I, uh, I, uh, but I also react strongly against people who think it's, it's a kind of play thing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot, a lot of people think that now. Uh, I mean, I, I hardly can open uh, the New York Review of Books or the TLS without finding somebody dumping on the notion of truth. What they're dumping on is is the sense that Plato attached to truths, not you know, not not your notion of truths or uh, well, well, the, the vegetarian well, well, notions. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. but 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 most people can't tell the difference, though. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I mean, it, it has it has promoted a kind of loose uh, relativism. It seems to me that that uh, really is intellectually sick. Yeah, I, I can't, I'm, you know, I, I'm always being accused of being a relativist and, you know, whenever, oh, I'm whenever, not accusing you no, of I, anything. I know, but, you know, one never knows <laughs> one's own sicknesses, but, <laughs> but I've never, you know, it's never, it's not a charge that ever made much sense to me. I mean, people are sloppy, people don't argue very well for their views, people, uh, wave aside questions they really ought to talk about. Yeah, they, people do lots of things. But I'm not, sh you know, I've never been sure what it was to be a relativist. I mean, oh, uh, right. Um, I agree. It's, um, and and there, I mean, one of the things I like best about your work is your utter insouciance about saying that, you know, aesthetic, moral judgments, judgments of manners, and so forth are true in exactly the same sense that you know all the other stuff is true. All the others, you know, all the propositions of atomic physics are true, uh, which sort of at one stroke gets rid of an enormous amount of the true platonic or false, heritage. I think you yeah, sorry, true or false. Yeah, <laughs> right. uh, yeah. I mean that, that that gets rid rid of an awful lot of the ancient problematic. Uh, but I, I keep finding myself in in the position of offering, you know, this as an example of one of the virtues of Davidsonianism. And people saying, Davidson can't really say that. Davidson is a realist like I am. And then I quote you about how you don't have to be either a realist or an anti-realist. And they say, yeah, yeah, I know he says that, but really he shares my basic intuitions and you don't because you're a relativist. And you know, I don't know what to do at that point. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, don't think you, I don't think you have any of these things called realistic intuitions <laughs> no, that, I that don't people so. pride themselves on. Yeah. And you know the lack of such intuitions is what's supposed to make you fall over this cliff into this thing called relativism. At least I'm always told that's what I've done. Uh, but I've never, you know, I've never been able to sharpen up the issue in, in a way that you know gets past the usual rhetoric. Um, no, I, I agree with you about about uh, realism and anti-realism. Uh, but that's uh, I, I don't. I mean, aside from very special cases uh, of the sort that Dummett sometimes says is all he's interested in, namely uh, 
are, are there really uh, quarks or something like that? Well, that's a perfectly good question. Uh, it's a scientific question as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Well, anyway, I think we see eye to eye on, on, on the question of realism. Uh, and may, maybe in the case of, of relativism, uh, it's, it's, um, it's seldom a clear doctrine. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure there is any doctrine in the area. I mean, it's in, I mean, the people whom I get grouped with, Derrida, for example, are people who say, um, you know, they, they just go on endlessly against correspondence representation and so on. Right. I mean, it's the only string they have to their bow. Right. Uh, and, you know, they, they jazz it up a bit. But I can't see, you know, I don't know what they've done wrong. And yet there is, you know, there is this... I mean, you, you share this feeling that there's a sort of intellectual current around that, you know, is a bad thing. Well, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the kind of thing that, that uh, I, I read constantly is somebody says, well, so-and-so well, so maintains this. Somebody else maintains something that is clearly contrary to it. Now, now why should we say that one is true and the other false? Uh, uh, they're both true. Uh, 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 th that, if that's not explained, uh, and now I, I mean I really do read this in serious places quite often. I guess uh, I, I read the same thing and try to construe it sympathetically by saying that what they're doing is saying. I am following the time-honored technique of clearing up an apparent contradiction by making a distinction. And, well, uh, it, it, if, if they um, said that or, um, or even uh, tried to clear it up, uh, but they seem to think it's perfectly hap okay yeah. to just rest it there because nobody yeah. believes in truth anymore. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, nine times out of ten, it seems as though they're so simply confusing being true with what a lot of people think is true. Perhaps, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'd say some serious historian, I recent, very recently read this, I think, in, in one of these things I read, uh, uh, said, now, now in each period, of, of course, we have to, uh, we, we, we re revise the truth about history. And they revise what we think or what we say, but revise the truth. Mm. Now, I, what, what, you're sympathetic, and, and I am not. Yeah, I, 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 no, I, I, mean, I, I guess I regard it as, you know, trivial carelessness on the historian's part rather than a symptom of, you know, mm -hmm. something that affects the culture. I mean, I, let, me, let me change the subject. Yes. I, um, I was wondering what you thought about this good manian trope, there is no way the world is. Uh, does that does that have any appeal, or does it? Well, if it means, which is what I think it means to him, uh, uh, there's no one right vocabulary. There's no one right way of describing things. It's, I, of course, I completely agree. In fact, we have many different ways, and there could be more. I guess I think that I think accepting that point leads me back to you know one of the things. I've always had trouble with in your work, the, your attitude toward the fact of the matter, no fact of the matter distinction. I mean, there are times when you seem to take it as seriously as Klein and Dummett do. There are times when you seem to sort of brush it aside. I guess I find it more coherent with most of your views to brush it aside and say, you know, since there are umpteen ways of describing every situation, uh, does it profit us to distinguish the ones where two describers are arguing about fact 
and the ones where the two describers are just saying, uh, you know, it's convention or it's, you know, you know, it isn't a matter of fact. In my inclination is to say, um, you know, what we have are people saying different things in response to the same stimulus. It is for the sociologist of inquiry to tell us, you know, when it is useful, when it is, when it is useful for them to dispute in certain ways, to bring certain considerations to bear when it is not. It is for them to decide what issues they can wave aside, what issues they need to pursue further. When the philosopher comes along and says in the manner of Quine, you know, when it's temperature scales, when it's translation, no fact of the matter. This strikes me as, you know, I, I don't see what the pragmatic import of that remark is. Uh, well, I guess I'm somewhere in between. Uh, uh, the cases where I think there's no fact of the matter are cases where, so to speak, it's provable. Uh, it's, it's provable that there's no fact of the matter. Uh, uh, if I say the temperature is 20, uh, uh, and, uh, and you say, but on what scale? I say, no, never mind the scale. I just say it's 20. I say, no, there's no fact of the matter. Uh, uh, there's no fact of the matter whether the temperature is Fahrenheit or centigrade. There's no fact of the matter. Uh, uh, now, I, th I think uh, Quine's uh, um, indeterminacy of translation should be viewed in exactly that way. I have trouble seeing what that way is. I mean, uh, I mean my attitude toward the guy who says it's 20 is tell me more, you know, what scale are you using? Exactly. Uh, my attitude toward anybody who says something I'm not immediately prepared to accept and run with is tell me more. Fine. You know, uh, and when it's, you know, when I'm told in one case I'm being asked for a convention, in another case I'm asked to pursue a question of fact, I can't see how I know which I'm being asked to do. Uh, well. I think I think the cases where there's no fact of the matter are few. Um, if, if if two people argue about whether whether uh, it makes sense to say that the sun rises, for example, I think there's no fact of the matter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, and there are people who did argue about that, all right, uh, and uh, in fact. Uh, is, is it uh, Jerry Fodor or, oh no, it's Chomsky who constantly uses this as an example. Uh, Chomsky constantly uh, 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 gives us an example of people who simply don't know what the truth is. Uh, these people are back where, where it's left, what, believing what Quine and I believe about language. Uh, Chomsky says, is like believing that the sun rises. Mm. The sun doesn't rise. All right, the earth just goes around. Mm. Now I'd say, no. <laughs> uh, the, it's a bad example. He might, he may be right about Quine and me, but, but, um, but it's a bad example. The sun does rise. Maybe we could talk a bit about how you see the, you know, the course of philosophy in the century. I'm, I, I have, in my own stuff, wobbled back and forth between saying, you know, the linguistic turn and or analytic philosophy was a, a great step forward, and saying, oh no, it was just sort of, you know, Kant warmed over with language stuck in place of consciousness, experience, thought, and we had to go through the same dialectic, only doing it in terms of language, and, you know, did we really, you know, did we really get anywhere that we hadn't been before? And, yeah, when I'm in this mood, I say, oh, we got a lot out of Wittgenstein, and the 
parts of Klein, Sellers, and you that, as it were, you know, reinforce Wittgenstein. But in you know, in our sense of what philosophy could do for us, have we gotten beyond the period of Mach and James? Uh, and I honestly don't know the answer to that. I mean, sometimes I think the linguistic turn was a great flood of light. Sometimes I think it was, you know, particularly when I read A Nice Derangement of Epithet, <laughs> uh, I think it was just sort of a transitional stage from an intellectual period when we had a discipline called philosophy that had a kind of autonomy to the kind of sociologized and historicized conception of philosophy that Dewey had as just sort of, you know, kibitzing over alternative, you know, discourses within the culture and, you know, cleaning up some loose edges and perhaps, you know, offering imaginative suggestions here and there. And I still, you know, I still wander back and forth. When I'm in Europe, and I'm trying to explain that analytic philosophy is really important, and you know they ought to read you, and they ought to read Sowers, and you know, they ought to read Wittgenstein. I take one line when I'm at a, when I'm at home. <laughs> I tend to say, you know, you know, we've been doing this sort of thing for 50 years now, and you know, maybe we should drop, maybe we should drop meaning as a topic, reference as a topic. You know, maybe we should, you know, give this a rest. <laughs> um, anyway, you have any reflections on any of this stuff? Oh, well, uh, it does seem to me that that uh, philosophy of cha has changed a lot since since uh, I, I was interested in it in, in college and graduate school, uh, and 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 one one difference is that at least for a lot of the time between then and now. Uh, it, it's been much f further away from what ordinary people were interested in and could easily read, and uh, has had much less engagement with with popular culture and and politics, for that matter, uh, than it was almost taken for granted that it had then. Uh, to what extent that is geared to the extent to which it's become technical uh, in this country, I don't know because, after all, one of the people that uh, that have every, had a, had a good deal of influence and was certainly read by many people was Russell, uh, and and uh, he's one of the. I mean, he had difficult ideas. Uh, he was very good at expressing them in a way that people could understand, but. Uh, uh, but it wasn't that he didn't do what we would consider to be technical f philosophy. He certainly did, but he, but he also did he wrote a lot about politics and morals and so on. Uh, uh, we uh, whether so I, I'm not I'm not sure about the explanation. I mean, I, did the linguistic turn make f philosophy? less available. Uh, I guess I just don't know because, after all, Wittgenstein was part of the linguistic turn. Uh, and, and although I don't think he's had a lot of political influence, uh, uh, he certainly has had an influence outside of philosophy uh, and very, very considerable. Uh, so I'm at a loss to, to uh, I think appropriately, uh, at, a, at a loss to think of explanations of, for why philosophy has lost touch to the extent that it has. Um, it might partly be just that there's so many more of them mm. yeah. that they can constitute their own audience in a way that, I mean, when I was an undergraduate, you know, there were five or six people at Harvard who were, had, had a voice in public. Um, R.B. Perry and Hawking, uh, these, these people were 
known to a, a large public, and they, they, and Whitehead, of course, uh, they, they thought of themselves as uh, having important things to say to, to the general public on education and all sorts of issues. And philosophers that in general don't have that feeling, though of course so, some of them do write on what they think to be very important social problems. They don't expect to be listened to by senators. And mm -hmm. so, uh, and I think this is bad. I, I think it, I think it's a shame. Not, not, not that I tend, intend to mend my own ways, but, but. Um, But you have mended your ways. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I guess I don't. You know, I don't think it would matter if nobody who taught in a philosophy department was ever heard of by anybody outside a philosophy department. I mean, you know, there'll there'll always be intellectuals who will you know give yeah. their views on you know politics, society, culture, whatnot. And if you know if they happen to be in, they happen to be philosophers, fine. If not, it doesn't matter. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess what what I'm that's maybe I'm not clear what I'm worried about. Um, the way I think of it is that this is the line I've been pressing for 20 years ever since I wrote Mirror of Nature is that uh, Frege and Russell, as it were, reverted to Kant's picture of what philosophy was, namely it you know, did something with form instead of content. <laughs> It rose above mm -hmm. the empirical, or it rose above the historical, or it rose above something, and you know it had you know, you know, conceptual analysis or something. And the reason there's this great big analytic continental gap is that for the rest of the philosophical world, Kant is sort of dead, <laughs> and you know Hegel and Nietzsche took his place. And so when they think of being a philosopher, they think Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche, and of course you've got to read Kant because Hegel is unintelligible without right. Kant, you know, all that. But still, you don't, you don't want to do what Kant thought philosophy was, and the Anglophones do want to do what Kant thought philosophy was. Mm. Um, okay. And sometimes I think that, you know, we need both within the same discipline. Sometimes I think, no, the, Anglo the Anglophones are caught in a time lag. You know, that the rest of the world moved on <laughs> and we, you know, we let Frege recontianize us or Frege and his heirs recontianize us. And like I say, I tend to talk out of both sides of my mouth depending on what part of the world I'm in. What, 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 what is the, the, the huge difference that you see between Kant and the post-Kantians? The, I think the huge difference is um, Kant had a scheme content distinction, Hegel and Dewey didn't. Uh, that is, for Hegel, scheme was always turning into content. Kind of, you, know, you know, like for Dewey, means are always fading into ends and vice versa. For right. both him and Hegel, scheme and content were just, you know, temporary, arbitrary, sociologically, historically determined considerations. I, I think that's still sort of anathema to most Anglophone philosophers. I mean, they, I think, want there to be, you know, a philosophical method, no, maybe not a method, but, you know, a philosophical activity characterized by being on the scheme side, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you like. And it seems to me that everything that's happened to break down all the Kantian distinctions in the course of the development of analytic philosophy, as it were, cut the metaphilosophical ground out from under analytic philosophy. So the Anglophone world is sort of doing a kind, you know, it's still, you know, in its public rhetoric goes on and on about, you know, clarity of concepts and conceptual confusion and, you know, we'll clear, clear up your concepts for you. You know, back at home, they don't, you know, they don't think there are such things as <laughs> concepts to be clarified. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're, you know, they're alternative uses of words. So it's as if uh, at the end of the dialectic that followed the linguistic turn, we had no room for Kant-style philosophy, but as a disciplinary matrix, we still look to Kant for 
you know, giving us a sense of our place and culture, our relation to the other disciplines, and so on. Yeah, well, if, if the scheme content distinction is the, is, is the mark, then it, it not only continued after Kant, but, uh, I mean, all of the logical positivists in one way or another certainly accepted it. Uh, and it, it, at least in Anglophone, well, in, in what we roughly call analytic philosophy, uh, it com what became completely embedded uh, in the subject. Now, whether that means a strong distinction between analytic and synthetic is a related question, but it's not exactly the same question, uh, because the analytic-synthetic distinction is one you can make within language itself, whereas the scheme content thing is a, basically an epistemological uh, idea that rests upon the idea of foundationalism of some sort or other. That's, it's certainly in Kant, but it didn't die with Kant by any means. Uh, uh, in fact, Kant I introduced, in a way, uh, conceptual relativism. Uh, I mean, he happened to think we're stuck with one system, but he introduced the possibility of many systems, and that was where the scheme content distinction really took off, so, yeah. so to speak. So I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I, I see it exactly the way you do. Um, uh, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm against both the analytic synthetic and the scheme content distinctions. Uh, and I know, I think you think I go against that in at least two different ways. Uh, and. Uh, I've thought about that from time to time and wondered uh, if I try to say what I think about the notion of truth, for example, uh, does, is that really a bad style analytic philosophy? Well, in some, some way it may be, but in, in another way it certainly isn't. Uh, I don't think it could be defined and I don't think it makes sense even to try uh, to give a definition. So in one sense of what analytic philosophy always tried to do. I, th I think it's hopeless in almost any case we'd be interested in doing it. Uh, uh, I haven't said much about this, but I certainly know that we use the word true in a lot of different contexts. Uh, uh, and I'm just interested in one particular one. Uh, and there, my way of dealing with it is, is to trace out connections that most of us take for granted, but don't necessarily see all the implications of them. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure, I mean, it, it seems to me at least that, that the, the method I use is, is a, has a much broader brush to it. I say, well, here, here, here are a whole lot of things that we think about truth. Put them together and, and uh, you can see that uh, a theory of this kind captures in a very rough way uh, uh, something that actually is much more complicated than that and so forth. But, but what it catches in a rough way is just the notion of the fact that different beliefs and different sentences are for all of us related to each other in various ways. And those relations, at the, the most clear of those relations, uh, have to do with one sentence implying another. Uh, and we, we don't necessarily agree on how which ones imply which ones, uh, but nevertheless, we do. We think it's a good kind of reasoning uh, if we go from one to another in such a way as to preserve truth, even though we don't know that the premises are true. Uh, we're convinced that if the premises are true, the conclusion is true. Now. That, that kind of interaction between thoughts, sentences, or how arguments go when we're doing our best to give good arguments uh, is exactly what's captured by Tarski. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm interested in him. And s since you see a lot of good in Brandom's uh, uh, emphasis upon how we argue, right? I'd say we're interested in the same thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
I mean, good arguments are uh, truth preserving, a and uh, that if you want to if you want to prove that an argument uh, is valid, that is, that you have to have a theory of truth. That's for me. That's the big work uh, of a theory of truth. It just shows what what well, it lies behind common sense. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. The other thing that, that I thought you, you might be, be um, loading on me a little more than is right, as you say, I, 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 ha I have a project. Uh, I, I mean, at one time, I, th I, th I thought it was a big insight uh, for people who were trying to analyze things like indirect discourse and belief sentences and so on and a lot of other things too, uh, to see that there was a sense in which you didn't understand their suggestions uh, unless you could back it up with a clear semantics. Uh, and so I became interested in producing such a semantic analysis for things that we're all interested in, like causal statements and so forth. Uh, I never was as beset as many people thought I was with the idea of uh, let's work out every last detail. Mm. Uh, uh, John Wallace and I once, we, we were egging each other on, I must say, at one, this a long time ago, uh, when he was a student of mine. Uh, and we said, of course, you've got to be able to do this for every sentence. So we sat down with War and Peace or something like that, and he said, well, we'll take the first sentence, and then we'll go on to the next sentence and so forth, uh, and we'll say what the logical form of everything in it is. We never got beyond the first sentence. <laughs> so so every, ever since then, when people said, Davidson's got this great project, it's a, uh, I've always laughed. and thought, well, that project didn't, didn't get off the ground. But, and, you know, I may be wrong about this, but I think that ever since the original positivist you know, program of analyzing everything down to yeah. you know, phenomenal primitives and so forth, right. when it drained into the sands, Anglophone philosophers have been hoping somebody would come up with something analogous. And one effect you had yeah. at Oxford was to say, oh, thank God, we have our project again. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, that's uh, true. And you know, th then, you know, then somehow they thought, well, do we? I mean, you know, and, yeah. And and that's, that's I, I guess one thing I find funny about our discipline, or the Anglophone part of our discipline, is that, you know, somehow analytic philosophy only makes sense if you have a project like Kant's or like Carnap's or like the so-called Davidson program, mm -hmm. and yet somehow nobody has it, but we're still, you know. We still live in hope, <laughs> or or something. Well, I know that this doesn't interest you much, but but I, I think, in, in in fact, this uh, uh, insight that I had uh, th that he, here here were some standards. Uh, uh, maybe not for getting it right, but surely for getting it wrong. Uh, uh, has done a lot of good. I mean, I, th I think a lot of good philosophy has resulted from that. I think a lot of highly intelligent philosophy has resulted. I mean, you know, I mean, there, some of the things you've done and some of your students have done have taken my breath away. I mean, your your analysis of you know Galileo said that the, mm -hmm. earth, the earth moves. You know, I, I was you know I was stunned by it when I first read it, and I'm you know I, I think it's one of the neatest things that I ever came across in philosophy. And yeah, you know, there are a lot of things you've done like that, and a lot of things other people have done. And yet, what I want to do is sort of relate these things to, you know, some great big something or other. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I can't do. And that's what sometimes makes me feel... Um, Why do you think it should be related to some great big something or other? I'm a romantic. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I mean, I... You know, I mean, when I read literary critics who give an immensely clever reading of a text, I'm impressed. But the only critics I really love are the ones who, you know, the Harold Blooms, the, you know, the people like that who have a story to tell about, you know, 
how we got from here to there and what lies ahead and all that stuff. And I suppose that's my taste for Hegel, Dewey, and you know, romantic philosophy of that sort. It's well, when it comes to the literary critics, I love them both. Mm. Really. Mm. I mean, if they're good. I don't know if this is the most appropriate moment, but I'd like to bring in a question that Donald's certainly written uh, a piece on metaphor and how you view the concept of metaphor in your... You've obviously agreed a lot between you as to what you consider in common, but is there any differences, do you think, in your concept of metaphor? I thought of myself as just, you know, just taking Don... I mean, this is something I keep doing. I mean, I, I took Donald's piece on metaphor and just, you know, wrote it up, and I took his piece on divided consciousness and Freud and, you know, wrote it up. I never thought of myself as differing, though I admit every time I do this, people say I get Davidson wrong. But, you know, and uh, I, w I would have said, uh, in those two cases, certainly, that, that uh, you had me exactly right. Good. Yeah. In fact, uh, I, I mean, people do often say that you got me wrong, uh, and, and sometimes they're, they're little things where I think you're quite conscious that we wouldn't agree. But I, I, my own view is that uh, on the things that matter the most to me, you're one of the few people who has not only got it right, but furthermore uh, likes it, <laughs> which, which is, <laughs> let's say, uh, well, I mean, that isn't, the important thing isn't that you like it. The important thing is that you make something of it. Mm. And, and uh, no, nobody can ask for anything better than that, I think, in philosophy. You know, certainly readings, you know, reading, you know, um, the original scheme content stuff back with your Locke lectures and then reading the metaphor stuff and then reading the Freud stuff, you know, has made, you know, permanent changes in the way I've thought about things. So, you know, I have sometimes had the feeling that I just sort of go around you know, waiting for Donald to drop, you know, drop another idea, and I'll, <laughs> you know. Then I'll act as PR man, but, um, or one of the PR men. But I, 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 do, I do keep getting, I, I, read a, I read my thing on metaphor, which I thought was just, you know, extrapolating from what you said to the Aristotelian society. You know, not only did they think it was worthless, uh, they thought that since it was worthless, it couldn't be David's <laughs> <laughs> As I remember, you were you were comparing my view with with uh, some philosophy. Oh, uh, Mary has a right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah they, the argument there was uh, Hesse made a great point about saying meta metaphors are cognitive. And oh yes, I, right. I was saying no, right. that's not the point. They're yeah. they're just not in the dictionary. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, at all. I certainly thought thought you had that right. And, yeah. Well. People love to disagree with my view about that, of course, mm -hmm. because people want to have a theory about what the cognitive content is. Yeah. It's much more fun than to say it doesn't, that isn't the right way to think about yeah. it. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, uh, you undermine the whole metaphor business, really, I think, with that paper. And, but it churns along anyway. Oh, it certainly and, does. Yes. And everybody has to include one paragraph saying why we don't have to consider Davidson. But, right. you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I had something slightly different in mind, and maybe <clears throat> um, you were the wrong person, Richard, to bring up. If that's the, the issue that I'd, I think is misattributed to the sort of view that's held by um, a lot of persons who think they espouse correctly to the Rortian mm -hmm. view of the world. That was more of what I had in mind, and I thought that Donald's piece on metaphor precisely grounds the thing into showing what metaphor, what's wrong with metaphor, and then the wrong sort of uh, interpretation is attributed to you that uh, there's some sort of that there shouldn't be some kind of a distinction between uh, the kind of sentences that you would have in literature and the kind of sentences that you would have. Yeah, I don't want there to be a distinction between <coughs> sentences. I want to be there to be a distinction between the kinds of communities that to toss the sentences around. Right. Because I don't want to divide the language up into the metaphorical and literal part. Right. I, what you know what. Science is full of metaphors. Yeah, what, what I got from Donald is that, you know, meta metaphors, you know, don't last very long. If they're any good, they get literalized. Right. And so metaphoricity is a transitory right. feature of original thought. <laughs> right. uh, 
but the, I mean, I, I think Mary put her point in a way that was needlessly paradoxical, and mm. uh, somehow every, every, every time you say anything like science uses metaphors too, people accuse you of saying, you know, there, there isn't any real world. Right, exactly. I see. Yes. That's right. the point. Yeah. Yes. Because they're so convinced that you know language splits down the middle between the, the referring right. bits and the other bits, and yeah. you know, right. science, science must refer you know always all the time. <laughs> Dick, may I ask you a question? Uh, you you've often uh, called me a pragmatist, perhaps at the same time urging me to be more of one, and. Uh, I uh, declined uh, at first on the, on the grounds that I couldn't buy the uh, standard pragmatic formulations of, of uh, truth. Uh, and I, I, I have the feeling now that, that you don't accept them either. Uh, and so I'm wondering on what grounds now if any, would you still say I am a pragmatist? Yeah, it's a very good question. I, I, let me start by saying one of the best things you did for me was convincing me that in order to follow up on James and Dewey, I didn't have to have anything called a pragmatist theory of truth. <laughs> now, I, I somehow, before your stuff about the indefinability of true, began to get clear in my head, I thought, well, if truth isn't correspondence, you've got to say what it is. And by reading you, I realized, no, you don't. You, you, know, uh, you, can, you don't have to have a theory about it. Uh, so I now, th I now think of the word pragmatism as having two senses. There's a fairly narrow sense in which it just means not accepting a correspondence theory of truth. And you can do that in sort of, you know, simple, unromantic, quasi-technical ways. Nobody's ever made sense of the notion, you know, what do you do with negative hypotheticals? Uh, you know, you have to create these things called facts and, you know, where they come from, you know, stuff like that. And you're very helpful for, you know, that kind of thing. There's, an, there's a big romantic sense of pragmatism, which I attribute to James and Dewey, particularly to Dewey, uh, which says, now that we're free of the correspondence theory of truth, we have a change in humanity's self-image. It used to be we were responsible to old nobody. Then we became responsible to the nature of reality. Now it turns out that we're not responsible to the nature of reality. Uh, we interact with the rest of the universe. It conditions our behavior. We condition a bit of its behavior. But the, there's not a relation of responsibility of human beings to anything non-human. All human responsibility is responsibility of human beings to one another in, in individuals and groups. That's, as it were, the romantic part of Dewey that I'm fondest of. <laughs> I, I, and which, as it were, starts from saying, let's get rid of the correspondence theory of truth, and then runs with it in direction of, you know, what do you call it, philosophical anthropology or something like that. Uh, and I have no idea, you know, whether you like this idea of, you know, transforming the image of the human situation in this anti, you know, in this way of abandoning the idea of responsibility to the non-human. I think of it as the distinctive thing about 20th century philosophy. I mean, I, th I think that's what binds the, you know, the important analytic p figures and the important non-analytic figures together. I, 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 believe it or not, I have a book coming out in 10 chapters called Pragmatism as Anti-Authoritarianism, oh. but, but in Catalan, not in English. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. The Girona letters. Right, right. Uh, oh. I don't, it'll, publish, it'll be published in some other form in English. Uh, but anyway, to get back to the question, I mean, you're obviously a pragmatist in the narrow sense in which pragmatists don't right. believe in the correspondence theory of truth. And I keep, as it were, trying to drag you into this, you know, larger romantic sense of by getting rid of 
the, of the correspondence theory of truth, you know, the character of human life has changed. <laughs> well, I'd like to think so. Uh, uh, and I, I, I mean, uh, in general, I, I agree with you about responsibility, uh, except uh, I, I wouldn't mind saying, I don't know whether the word responsible is just the right word, but, but uh, uh, it, it, it seems to me we ought also to accept uh, some, some kind of obligation uh, toward animals. Mm. Uh, uh, and even perhaps toward the environment. Yeah, I, the, the, I, I can buy that because I think of it as sort of enlarging the sense of us from, so to speak, the straight white males to you know other featherless bipeds and on right. on out yeah. from there. <laughs> uh, but what it you know what it avoids is the notion. You know the sort of standard religious Kantian notion of obligation. You know, not only would this be a good idea, but you should right. because you know a great non-human power called pure practical reason or the will of God or something right. like that tells you to. Yeah. Well, it's, it sounds to me as though by your standards, I am a, a straightforward pragmatist, mm. even in the romantic sense. Even in the romantic yeah. sense. That's nice.